The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So today we'll actually just do a brief uh, um, chapter on Bayesian statistics. And uh, there's entire courses on Bayesian statistics. There's entire books on Bayesian statistics. There's entire careers on Bayesian statistics. So admittedly, uh, I'm not going to be able to do it justice and tell you all the interesting things that are happening in Bayesian statistics. But I think it's important as a statistician to know what it is, how it works, because it's actually a weapon of choice for many practitioners. And, uh, and uh, because it allows them to incorporate their knowledge about a problem in a fairly systematic manner. So if you look at, like, say, the, the Bayesian statistics literature, it's, it's, it's huge. And um, so here I give you, a, you know, sort of a range of what uh, you can expect to see in Bayesian statistics from your, you know, second edition of a traditional book, uh, something that involves computation, some things that involve rethinking and there's a lot of Bayesian thinking uh, there's a lot of things that you know talk about sort of like philosophy of thinking Bayesian uh, this book for example seems to be one of them this book is definitely one of them uh, this one represents sort of a wide a, a broad literature on Bayesian statistics uh, for applications for example in social sciences but even in large-scale machine learning there's a lot of Bayesian statistics happening particular using something called Bayesian nonparametrics or hierarchical uh, Bayesian modeling. So uh, we do have some experts uh, at MIT in the, in the C-cell. Uh, Tamara Broderick, for example, is a person who does uh, uh, quite a bit of interesting work on Bayesian nonparametrics. And uh, if that's something you want to know more about, I urge you to, to go and talk to her. Uh, so, you know, before we go into those more advanced things, we need to start with, you know, what is, what is the Bayesian approach? What do, what do Bayesians do and how is it different from what we've been doing so far? So to understand the difference between Bayesians and what we've been doing so far is we need to first put a name on what we've been doing so far. It's called frequentist statistics, which so is usually Bayesian versus frequentist statistics. I mean, by versus, I don't mean that there's naturally an opposition to them. Uh, actually, often you will see the same method that comes out of both approaches. So let's see how we did it, right? The first thing, we had data, right? We observed some data. And we assumed that this data was generated randomly. The reason we did that is that because this would allow us to leverage tools from probability. So let's say by nature, measurements, you do a survey, you get some data, OK? Then we made some assumptions on the data generating process. For example, we assumed they were IID. That was one of the recurring things. Sometimes we assume it was Gaussian uh, if we wanted to use, say, t-test. Maybe we did some nonparametric statistics. So we assume it was a smooth function or maybe linear regression function. Right? So those are our modeling. And this was basically a way to say, well, we're not going to allow for any distributions for the data that we have, but maybe s a small set of distributions that index by some small parameters, for example. Or at least, you know, remove some of the possibilities. Otherwise, there's nothing we can learn. And, uh, and so, for example, this was associated to some parameter of interest, say theta uh, or beta in the regression model. All right, then we had this unknown problem and this unknown thing. Uh, a known parameter in, we wanted to find it. We wanted to either estimate it or test it or maybe find a confidence interval for this object. All right? So, so far, I should not have said anything that's, gonna, that's new, but this last sentence is actually what's going to be different from the, the Bayesian part. In particular, this unknown but fixed thing is what's going to be changing. All right, so in the Bayesian approach, we still assume that we observe uh, uh, some random data. But the generating process is slightly different. It's sort of a two-layer process. And there's one process that generates the parameter, and then one process that, given this parameter, generates the data. So what the first layer does, right? I mean, nobody really believes that there's some random process that's happening about you know, generating what is going to be the true ex expected number of people who turn their head to the right when they kiss. But this is actually going to be something that brings us some, uh, uh, you know, easiness for us to incorporate what we call prior belief, right? So 
We'll see an example in a second, but often you actually have prior belief of what this parameter should be, right? When we did, uh, say, least squares, we looked over all of the vectors in all of R to the P, including the ones that have coefficients equal to, you know, 50 million. And so those are things that maybe we might be able to rule out and maybe we might be able to rule out at a much smaller scale. For example, well, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an expert on, uh, on uh, you know, turning your head to the right or to the left, but you know, maybe you can rule out the fact that you know, almost everybody's turning their head in the same direction or almost everybody's turning their head to another direction. So we want to, we have this prior belief and this prior belief is gonna play, say, hopefully less and less important role as we collect more and more data. But if we have a smaller amount of data, we might want to be able to use this information, all right? Rather than just shooting in the dark. And so, the idea is to have this prior belief, and then we want to update this prior belief into a, what's called a posterior belief after we've seen some data, right? Maybe I believe that, you know, there's something that should be in some range, but maybe after I see data, maybe it's comforting me in my belief, so I'm actually having maybe a belief that's more, so a belief encompasses basically what you think and how strongly you think about it. That's what I call belief, right? So for example, if I have a belief about some parameter theta, maybe my belief is telling me where theta should be and, and, and how strongly I believe in it in the sense that I have a very narrow uh, region where theta could be. All right, and so the posterior belief says, well, you see some data and maybe you're more confident or less confident about what you've seen. Maybe you've shifted your belief a little bit. And so that's what we're gonna try to see and how to do this in a principled manner. So of course, to understand this better, uh, there's nothing better than an example. So Let's talk about another stupid statistical question, which is let's try to understand P. Uh, of course, I'm not gonna talk about politics from now on. So uh, there, let's talk about P, the proportion of women in the population. Okay, and so what I could do is to collect some data, X1, Xn, and assume that they're with some parameter p unknown, right? So p is in 0, 1. Okay, let's assume that those guys are ID. So this is just an indicator for each of my uh, uh, collected data, whether the person I, I, I randomly sample is a woman, I get a 1, and if it's a man, I get a 0. Okay, and so now the question is, uh, 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 I sample these people randomly, I denote their, uh, their gender, and uh, the frequentist approach was just saying, okay, let's just estimate p hat being xn bar, and then we could do some tests, right? So here there's a test, I wanna test maybe if p is equal to 0.5 or not. That sounds like a pretty reasonable uh, thing to test. And, uh, but, you know, we want to also maybe estimate p, but here, this is a case where we definitely have prior belief of what P should be, right? We are pretty confident that P is not gonna be 0.7. We actually believe that P should be extremely close to one half. Okay, but maybe not exactly, maybe, I don't know, maybe this population is not the population in the world, but maybe this is the population of, say, some college, and we want to understand if this college has half women or not, right? So maybe we know it's gonna be close to one half, but maybe we're not quite sure. And so we're gonna want to integrate that knowledge, all right? So I could integrate it in a blunt manner by saying, you know, discard the data and say that P is equal to one half. But maybe that's just a little too much. So how do I do this trade off between, you know, adding the data and combining it with this prior knowledge? In many ways, in many instances, essentially what's gonna happen is this, this one half is gonna act like one new observation, essentially. So if you have you know, five observations, this is just the sixth observation, which will play a role. If you have a million observations, you're gonna have a million and one, and it's not gonna play so much of a role. That's basically how it goes. That's basically how it goes, uh, but uh, <laughs> definitely not always. All right, because uh, we'll see that if I take my prior to be a point minus that one half here, uh, it's basically as if I was decarding my data. So essentially, there's also your ability to uh, encompass how strongly you believe in this prior. And if you believe infinitely more in the prior than you believe in the data you collected, then of course, it's not gonna act like one more observation. All right, so 
the Bayesian approach is a tool to one, include mathematically our prior, and uh, our prior belief into statistical procedures, right? So maybe I have this prior knowledge, but if I'm a medical doctor, it's not clear to me how I'm gonna turn this into some principal way of, of building estimators. And of course, the second goal is gonna be to update this prior belief into uh, a posterior belief by using the data, all right? So how do I do this? And at some point I sort of suggested that there's two layers. One is where you draw the parameter at random. And two, uh, 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 once you have the parameter, condition on this parameter, you draw your data. Nobody believes this actually is happening, that nature is just rolling dice for us and choosing parameters at random. But what's happening is that this idea that the parameter comes from some random distribution actually captures very well this idea that how you would encompass your prior, right? How would you say my belief is as follows? Well, here's an example about P. I'm 90% sure that P is between 0.4 and 0.6. And I'm 95% sure that P is between 0.3 and 0.8. Okay, so essentially I have this possible value of P and what I know is that there's 95 per, there's 90 percent here between uh, what did I say point uh, four and point six and then I have point three and point eight and I know that I'm 95 percent sure that I'm in here and this if you remember this sort of looks like the kind of pictures that I made when I had some Gaussian right for example and I said oh here we have 90% of the observations, and here we have 95% of the observations. So in a way, if I were able to tell you all those ranges for all possible values, then I would essentially describe a probability distribution for P. And what I'm essentially saying is that P is gonna have this kind of shape. So of course, if I tell you only two, twice this information that there's 90% I'm here and I'm here, between here and here and 95% I'm between here and here, then there's many ways I can accomplish that, right? I could have something that looks like this maybe, right? I could be really, I mean, it could be like this. I mean, there's many ways I can have this. Some of them are definitely gonna be mathematically more convenient than others. And uh, hopefully we're gonna have things that I can parameterize very well. Rather than, because if I tell you this is this guy, then there's basically one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parameters, right? So I probably don't want something that has seven parameters, but maybe I can say, oh, it's a Gaussian, and I, all, all I have to do is to tell you where it's centered and what the standard deviation is. Okay, so the idea of using this two-layer thing where we think of the parameter P as being drawn from some distribution is really just a way for us to capture this information, our prior belief being well, you know, there's this percentage of chances that it's there. But the percent of the chance, I'm, not, I'm deliberately not using probability here. It's really, right, so it's really a way to, to get close to this. All right, so that's what I said. The, the true parameter is not random, but the Bayesian approach does as if it was random and then just spits out a procedure out of this, you know, thought process somehow, okay, this thought experiment. So when you practice Bayesian statistics a lot, you start getting automatisms, right? So you get like, you start getting some things that you do without really thinking about it. Just like when you're a statistician, the first thing you do is, you know, can I think of this data as being Gaussian, for example. When you're Bayesian, you're thinking about, okay, I have a set of parameters, right? So here, I, I can describe my parameter as being theta in general. <laughs> in some big space parameter theta, but you know, what, did, what spaces did we encounter? Well, we encountered the real line, we encountered the interval zero one for Bernoulli's, and we encountered maybe some, uh, the positive real line for exponential distributions, et cetera. And so what I'm gonna need to do if I want to model some, if I wanna put some prior on those spaces, I'm gonna have to have 
a usual set of tools for this guy, usual set of tools for this guy, usual set of tools for this guy. And by usual set of tools, I mean I'm going to have to have a family of distributions that support it on this. So in particular, this is the space in which my parameter that I usually denote by P for Bernoulli lives. And so what I need is to find a distribution on the interval 0, 1. Right? Just like this guy. The problem with the Gaussian is that it's not on the interval 0, 1. Right? It's going to spill out in the end, and it's not going to be something that works for me. And so the question is, you know, I need to think about distributions that are probably continuous. Why would I restrict myself to discrete distributions that are actually convenient? And for Bernoulli, one that's actually basically the main tool that everybody's using is the so-called beta distribution. All right, so the beta distribution has two parameters. So x follows a beta with parameters, say, a and b if it has a density f of x is equal to x to the a minus 1, 1 minus x to the b minus 1 if x is in the interval 0, 1, and 0 for all other x's. OK? So why is that uh, uh, a good thing? Well, it's a, it's a density that's on the interval 0, 1 for sure. But now I have these two parameters. And the set of shapes that I can get by tweaking those two parameters is incredible. OK? I mean, it's not going to be, it's going to be a unimodal distribution. It's still fairly nice, right? It's not going to be something that goes like this and this. Because you know, if you think about this, what would it mean if your prior distribution on the interval 0, 1 had this shape? It would mean that maybe you think that p is here, or maybe you think that p is here, or maybe you think that p is here, which essentially means that you think that p can, become, can come maybe from three different phenomena. And there's other models that are called mixtures for that that directly account for the fact that maybe there are several phenomena that are you know, aggregated in your data set. But if you think that your data set is sort of pure and that everything comes from the same phenomenon, you want something that looks like maybe like this, or maybe looks like this, or maybe is sort of symmetric. You want to get all this stuff, right? Maybe you want something that says, well, you know, if I'm talking about P being the probability of, uh, of uh, the proportion of women in the whole world, you want something that's probably really spiked around one half. Right, almost the point mass, because you know, I mean, okay, let's agree that 0.5 is the actual number. Uh, uh, so, you know, you want something maybe that says, okay, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm sure I'm not going to be really that way off. And so you want something that's really pointy. But if it's, you know, something you've never checked, right? And again, I cannot make uh, references at this point, but, you know, something where you might have some uncertainty, then uh, that should be around one half. Maybe you want something that's like a little more allows you to say, well, I think there's more around one half, but there are still some fluctuations that are possible. OK? And in particular here, I talk about P, where the two parameters, A and B, are actually the same. I call them A. One is called scale. The other one's called shape. Oh, by the way, sorry, this is not a density, so it actually has to be normalized. Right? So when you integrate this guy, it's going to be some function that depends on A and B. Actually, it depends on this function through the beta function. Right, which is this combination of gamma functions, so that's why it's called beta distribution. Uh, but uh, well, well, that's the definition of the beta function when you integrate this thing anyway. So, so I mean, you just have to normalize it. It's just a number that depends on the a and b. Okay. So here, if you took, if you take a equal to b, you have something that essentially is symmetric around one half, right? Because what does it look like? Well, it's something. So my d density f of x is going to be what is going to be my constant uh, times uh, x times 1 minus x to the a minus 1, right? And this function, x times a min 1 minus x, looks like this. We've drawn it before, right? That was something that showed up as being the variance of, um, that was the variance of my Bernoulli. So we know it's something that, you know, takes its maximum at 1 half. 
And now I'm just taking a power of this guy, so I'm really just distorting this thing into some, uh, in some uh, fairly uh, uh, symmetric manner. Okay. So the the um, the this distribution that we actually take up for p, right? So here I assume that p, the parameter, right? I mean, notice that this is kind of weird. First of all, this is probably the first time in this entire course that we have this has this something has a distribution when it's actually a lowercase letter. That's something you have to deal with because we've been using lowercase letters for parameters and now we want them to have a distribution. So that's what's gonna happen. All right, and this is called the prior distribution. Okay, so really I should write something like f of p is equal to a constant times p one minus uh, p to the a minus one. Well, no, actually I should not because then uh, it's confusing. Okay, so uh, let me not do this. One thing in terms of notation that I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write, when I have a constant here and I don't want to make it explicit, and we'll see in a second why I don't need to make it explicit, I'm gonna write this as f of x is proportional to uh, uh, x, one minus x to the a minus one, okay? So that's just, that's just to say equal to some constant that does not depend on x times this thing, okay? So if we continue with our experiment, now if p, right, so that's the experiment where I'm trying to, I'm drawing this data, x1 to xn, which is Bernoulli p, if p has some distribution, it's not clear what it means to have a Bernoulli with some random parameter. So what I'm gonna do is then I'm gonna first draw my p, let's say I get a number, 0.52, and then I'm gonna draw my data conditionally on P. All right, so here comes the first uh, and last uh, flowchart of this class. So I'm gonna first, um, uh, all right, so nature first draws P. Okay, so we'll P follows, say, some beta AA. Then I condition on P. And then I draw X1, Xn that are IID. Bernoulli P. Everybody understand the process of generating this data? All right, so you first draw a parameter and then you just flip this by those independent bias coins with this particular P. All right, so there's this like layered thing. So now conditionally on P, right? So here I, I have this prior about P, which was the thing. So this is just a thought process again, right? It's not anything that actually happens in practice. This is my way of thinking about how the data was generated. And from this, I'm gonna to try to come up with some procedure. Just like if your estimator is the average of the data, you don't have to understand probability to say that my estimator is the average of the data, right? I mean, anyone outside this room understand that the average is a good estimator for some you know, average behavior, and, uh, and they don't need to think of the data as being a random variable, et cetera. So same thing, basically. Now we will see, I mean, actually we won't, uh, but, uh, in this case, well, we will. In this case, you can see that essentially the posterior distribution is still a beta, all right? So what it means is that I had this thing, then I observe my data, and then I continue, and here I'm gonna update. My prior into some posterior distribution, pi, and here this guy is actually also a beta. All right, so pi now, p, my posterior distribution on p is also a beta distribution with the parameters that are on this slide and I don't have space to reproduce them. So I start the beginning of this flow chart as, as having p, which is a prior. I'm gonna get some observations and then I'm gonna update what my posterior is, okay? So this posterior is basically something that's in, the Bayes in Bayesian statistics, what's beautiful is as soon as you have the distribution, it it's essentially capturing all the information about the data that you want uh, for P. And it's not just a point, right? It's not just an average. It's actually an entire distribution for the possible values of theta. And it's not the same thing as saying, well, you know, if theta hat is equal to x n bar, in the Gaussian case, I know that this is some mean, mu, and then maybe it has variance sigma square over n. That's not what I mean by 
this is my posterior distribution, right? This is not what I mean. This is going to come from this guy, right? The Gaussian thing and the central limit theorem. But what I mean is this guy. And this came exclusively from, uh, from the prior distribution. If I had another prior, I would not necessarily have a beta distribution on the output. So when I have the same family of distributions at the beginning and at the end of this flow chart, I say that beta is a conjugate prior. Meaning I get I put in beta as a prior and I get betas at posteriors. And that's why betas are so popular. Conjugate priors are really nice because you know that whatever you put in, what you're gonna get in the end is a beta. So all you have to think about is the parameters. You don't have to check again what the posterior is gonna look like, what the PDF of this guy is gonna be. You don't have to think about it. You just have to check what the parameters are. And there's families of conjugate priors. Gaussian gives Gaussian, for example. There's a bunch of them, and this is what drives people to, into using specific priors as, oppos uh, as opposed to others. It has nice mathematical properties. Nobody believes that the P distribution is, uh, P is really distributed according to a uh, beta, but it's flexible enough and super convenient mathematically. All right, so now let's see for one second before we actually go any further. What I did, so A and B, I didn't mention it, A and B are both uh, in here, A and B are uh, positive numbers. Okay, they can be anything positive. So here what I did is that I updated A into A plus the sum of my data and B into B plus N minus the sum of my data. So that's essentially A becomes A plus the number of ones and B becomes B <coughs> Well, that's only when a and I have A and A, right? So the first parameters become itself plus the number of ones, and the second one becomes itself plus the number of zeros, right? And so just as a sanity check, what does this mean? If A goes to zero, what is the beta when A goes to zero? We can actually read this from here, right? Right, so we had A Sorry, uh, actually, let's take A goes to, uh, no, actually, sorry, let's just do this. Uh, okay, let's not do this now. I'll do it when we talk about non-informative prior because it's a, it's a little too messy here. Okay, so how do we do this? How did I get this posterior distribution given the prior? How do I update this? Well, this is called Bayesian statistics. And you've heard this word Bayes before, and the way you've heard it is in the Bayes formula, right? What was the Bayes formula? The Bayes formula was telling you that the probability of A given B was equal to something that depended on the probability of B given A, right? That's what it was. And uh, I, uh, I, I mean, you can actually either remember the formula or you can remember the definition. And this is what P of A and B divided by P of B. So this is P of B given A times P of A divided by P of B, right? That's what base formula is telling you, agree? So now what I want is to have something that's telling me uh, how this is, uh, is going to work, okay? So what is going to play the role of those events, A and B? Well, one is going to be, what is the, the dis so this is going to be the distribution of my parameter theta given that I see the data. And this is going to tell me what is the distribution of the data given that I know what my parameter theta is. But that part, if this is data and this is the parameter theta, this is what we've been all along. We've been doing all along. The distribution of the data given the parameter here was NIID Bernoulli P. I know that. I know exactly what their joint probability mass function is. Then that was what? So we said that let's, this is going to be my data and this is going to be my parameter. Okay? So that means that 
This is the probability of my data given the parameter. This is the probability uh, give, uh, given the parameter. This is the probability of the parameter. What is this? What did we call this? This is the prior. It's just the distribution of my parameter. Now, what is this? Well, this is just the distribution of the data itself. All right? So this is essentially the distribution of this if this was indeed a, uh, if, I mean, not conditioned on P, right? So if I don't condition on P, this data is going to be a bunch of IID uh, Bernoulli uh, uh, with some parameter, but the parameter is random, right? So for different realization of this data set, I'm going to get different parameters for the Bernoulli. And so that leads to some sort of, you know, convolution, I mean, it's not really a convolution in this case, but it's like some sort of composition of distributions, right? I have the distribution that comes, the randomness that comes from here, and then the randomness that's come from realizing the Bernoulli, right? So that's just the marginal distribution, and it's actually might be painful to understand what this is, right? I mean, in a way, it's sort of a mixture, and it's not super nice, but we'll see that this actually won't matter for us. This is gonna be some number, it's gonna be there, but it won't matter for us what it is, because it actually does not depend on the parameter and that's all that matters to us. Okay, so uh, let's put some names on those things, right? I mean, this was very informal, so let's put some actual names on uh, what we wanna call, what we call prior. So what is the formal definition of a prior? What is the formal de definition of a posterior? And uh, what are the rules to update it, okay? So I'm gonna have my data, which is gonna be x1, xn. And um, so let's say they're IID, but they don't actually have to. And so I'm gonna have given theta. And when I say given, it's either given like I did in the first part of this, class, this course in all previous chapters or conditionally on, right? So that's, if you're, in, if you're thinking like a Bayesian, that what I really mean is conditionally on this random parameter. Okay, so it's like as if it was a fixed number. Then uh, I'm gonna have, they're gonna have the distribution, x1, xn is gonna have some distribution, let's say, let's assume for now it's a PDF, Pn of x1, xn. Okay, and I'm gonna write theta like this. So for example, what is this? Well, that's, the, so let's say this is a PDF. It could be a PMF. Everything I say, I'm gonna think of them as being P PDFs. I'm gonna combine PDFs with PDF, but I could combine PDF with PMFs, PMF with PDFs, or PMF with PMFs, okay? So everywhere you see a D, it could be an M. Uh, all right, so now I have those things, so what does that mean? So here are some example. X1, Xn, or IID, N, theta one, right? So now I know exactly what the joint PDF of this thing is. So it means that Pn of x1, xn given theta is equal to what? Well, it's like one over sigma root, uh, sorry, one root two pi to the power n e to the minus sum from i equal one to n of xi minus theta squared divided by two, right? So that's just the joint distribution of n i i d n theta one random variable. Okay, so that's my PN given theta. Now, this is what we denoted by sort of like F sub theta before, right? We had the subscript before, but now we just put a bar in theta because we want to remember that this is actually conditioned on theta, right? But this is just notation. You should just think of this as being just the usual thing that you get from some uh, uh, statistical model. All right, so now uh, that's gonna be PN. And here I'm gonna assume that theta is, uh, why do I put pi here? Okay, uh, so if theta has prior distribution, pi, okay, so for example, so think of it as either PDF or PMF again. So for example, pi of theta was what? Well, it was my, uh, it was some constant times 
theta to the a minus 1, 1 minus theta to the a minus 1. Right? So it has some prior distribution, and that's another PMF. So now I'm given the distribution of my x is given theta. I'm given the distribution of my theta, so I'm given this guy. Right? That's this guy. I'm given that guy, which is my pi. Right? So that's my pn of x1, xn given theta. That's my pi of theta. And then I have here just, this is what? Well, this is just the integral of pn x1, xn uh, times uh, pi of theta d theta, right? Over all possible sets of theta. That's just when I integrate out my uh, theta, or I compute, say, the marginal distribution, I get this by integrating, right? That's just basic probability, conditional probabilities. Right, then if I had the PMF, I would just sum over the values of thetas. Okay? So now, uh, what I want is to find what's called, so that's the prior distribution, that's the posterior, and I want to find the posterior distribution. So it's cool. It's pi of theta given x1, xn. And so if I use Bayes' rule, I know that this is uh, pn of x1, xn given theta times pi of theta. And then it's divided by the, dis the distribution of uh, those guys, which I will write as integral over theta of pn x1, xn given theta times pi of theta d theta. Everybody's with me still? So if you're not comfortable with this, it means that you probably need to go read your couple pages on conditional densities and conditional PMFs from your probability class. There's really not much there. It's just a matter of being able to define those quantities, f, Density of x given y, this is just what's called a conditional density. You need to understand what this object is and how it relates to the joint distribution of x and y, or maybe the distribution of x or the distribution of y. But it's the same rules. I mean, one way to actually remember this is this is exactly the same rules as this. When you see a bar, it's the same thing as the probability of this and this guy. So for densities, it's just a comma divided by the, by the second guy, the probability of the second guy. That's it. All right, so if you remember this, you can just do some pattern matching and see what I just wrote here, OK? OK, so now I can compute every single one of these guys. This is something I get from my modeling. So I did not write this. It's not written in the, in the slides. But you know, I give a name to this guy that was my prior distribution. And that was my posterior distribution. In the, I don't know, chapter three maybe? What did we call this guy? Well, the one that does not have a name. And that's uh, in the box. This guy. How did we call it? It is the joint distribution of the xi's. And we gave it a name. It's the likelihood, right? This is exactly the likelihood. This was the likelihood of theta. And this is something that's very important to remember. And that really reminds you that these things are really not that different. Maximum likelihood estimation, and Bayesian estimation, because your posterior is really just your likelihood times something that's just putting some weights on the thetas depending on where you think theta should be, all right? So if I had, say, a maximum likelihood estimator and my likelihood in theta looked like this, but my prior in theta looked like this, I said, oh, I really want thetas that are like this. 
So what's going to happen is that my, I'm going to turn this into some posterior that looks like this. OK? So I'm just really waiting. This, this posterior, this is a constant that does not depend on theta, right? Agreed? I integrated over theta, so theta is gone. So forget about this guy. I have basically that the posterior distribution up to scaling, because it has to be a probability density and not just anything, any function that's positive, is the product of this guy. It's a weighted version of my likelihood. That's all it is. I'm just weighting the likelihood using my prior belief on theta. And so given this guy, a natural estimator, if you follow the maximum likelihood principle, would be the maximum of this posterior. Agreed? That would basically be doing exactly what uh, maximum likelihood estimation is telling you. So it turns out that you can. It's called maximum a posteriori, and I won't talk much about this, or map. So that's maximum a posteriori. So it's just the theta hat is the argmax of pi theta given x1, xn. And it sounds like it's OK. I give you a density, and you say, OK, I have a density for all values of my parameters. You're asking me to summarize it into one number. I'm just going to take the most likely number of those guys. But you could summarize it otherwise. You could take the average, right? You could take the median. You could take a bunch of numbers. And the beauty of Bayesian statistics is that you don't have to take any number in particular. You have an entire posterior distribution. This is not only telling you where theta is, but it's actually telling you the difference if you actually give as a something, it gives you the posterior, right? So now let's say the theta is a p between 0 and 1. If my posterior distribution looks like this, or if my posterior distribution looked like this, then those two guys have, one, the same mode, right? This is the same value. And they're symmetric, so they also have the same mean. So these two posterior distributions give me the same summary into one number. However, clearly one is much more confident than the other one, so I might as well just spit that as a solution. Okay, some people can, you can do even better. People actually do things such as drawing a random number from this distribution. So this is my number. Well, that's kind of dangerous, but you can imagine you could do this, right? All right. So uh, this is uh, what works. That's what we went through. Uh, so here, I, you notice, I, uh, I don't care so much about this part here, right? Because it does not depend on theta. So it's not, it's, I know that given the product of those two things, this thing is only the constant that I need to divide so that when I integrate this thing over theta, it integrates to 1. Because this has to be a probability density on theta. So I can write this and just forget about that part, and that's what's written on the, on the top of this part. OK? So just this notation, this sort of like weird alpha or, I don't know, infinity sign crop to the right, whatever you want to call this, uh, this thing is actually uh, just really emphasizing the fact that I don't care. I write it because, I mean, yeah, I write it because I can, but uh, and you know what it is. but. Uh, you don't actually have to, well, OK, in some instances, you have to compute the integral. In some instances, you don't have to compute the integral. And a lot of Bayesian computation is about saying, OK, it's actually really hard to compute this integral, so I'd rather not doing it. So let me try to find some methods that allow me to sample from the posterior distribution without having to compute this. And that's what's called Monte Carlo Markov chains, or MCMC, and that's exactly what they're doing. They're just using only ratios of things like that for different thetas, and which means that if you take ratios, the normalizing constant is gone, and you don't need to find this integral. OK, so we won't go into those details at all. That would be the purpose of an entire course on Bayesian uh, inference. Actually, even uh, Bayesian computations would be an, uh, an entire course on its own. Uh, there's some very interesting things that are going on there at the interface of stats and computations. All right. So let's go back to our example and see if we can actually compute any of those things, because it's very nice to give you some data, uh, some formulas. But you know, let's see if we can actually do it. All right, and in particular, can I actually recover this claim that the posterior associated to a, Bern to a beta prior uh, uh, with a Bernoulli uh, likelihood is actually giving me a beta again? All right, so 
What was my prior? Well, it was beta, so p was following a beta AA, which means that p, uh, the density, so that was pi of theta, uh, well, I'm going to write it as pi of, pi of p, was uh, proportional to p to the a minus 1 times 1 minus p to the a minus 1, right? So that's the first ingredient I need to compute my posterior. I really need only two if I want it about up to constant. The second one was pi. Well, we've computed that many times. And we had even a nice compact way of writing it, which was that pn of x1, xn, given a parameter p, right? So the density, the joint density of my data given p, that's my likelihood, the likelihood of p, was what? Well, it was p to the sum of the xi's, 1 minus p to the n minus sum of the xi's. Anybody wants me to parse this more? Or do you remember seeing that from maximum likelihood estimation? Yeah. Yeah, that's what conditioning does. Okay. Yeah. Can you repeat your slide um, for for the bottom there? It was p pi of p. Yeah. Do you think you were meaning d pi of t or is it the actual? Value? So d pi of t is a measure theoretic notation which I use without thinking, and I should not because I can see it upsets you. Uh, d pi of t is just a natural way to say that I integrate against whatever I'm given for for, for uh, the, the prior of um, theta. And in particular, if theta is just the mix of a PDF and a point mass, right? M maybe I say that my P takes value 0.5 with probability 0.5 and then is uniform uh, on the interval with probability 0.5. Okay, so for this, I neither have a PDF nor a PMF but I can still talk about integrating with respect to this, right? It's gonna look like if I take a function f of t, d pi of t is gonna be one half of f of uh, one half, right? That's the point mass with probability one half at one half, plus one half of the integral between zero and one of f of t dt. All right, so this is just a notation, which is actually, inter funnily enough, is interchangeable with pi of dt. But if you have a density, it's really just uh, uh, the density pi of t dt, if uh, pi is really a density. But that's when, it's, when pi is a measure and not a density. But uh, so everybody else, <laughs> forget about this. I mean, uh, this is not something you should really worry about at this point. This is more graduate level probability classes. Uh, but yeah, it's called measure theory. And that's when you think of pi as being a measure in an abstract fashion. And you don't have to worry whether it's a density or not or whether it has a density even. Okay. So everybody's okay with this? All right, so now I need to compute my posterior. And as I said, my posterior is really just the product of the likelihood weighted by the prior, right? So hopefully by uh, at this stage of your education, you can pr multiply two functions. All right, so what's happening is if I multiply this guy with this guy, well, P gets this guy to the power of this guy plus this guy. And then one minus P gets to the power N minus sum of Xi's so this is always from i equal 1 to n, and then plus a minus 1 as well. OK? And this is, sorry, this is up to constant, because I still need to solve this. And I could try to do it, but I really don't have to, because I know that if my density has this form, then it's a beta distribution, and then I can just go on Wikipedia and see what should be the normalization factor, but I know it's gonna be a beta distribution. It's actually the beta with parameter, so this is really my 
beta with parameter sum of xi i equal 1 to n plus a minus 1. And then the second parameter is n minus sum of the xi's plus a minus 1. OK? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I just wrote uh, what was uh, here. Oh, where, what happened to my 1? Oh, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Beta has the power minus 1, right? So that's, that's the parameter of the beta. And this is the parameter of the beta, right? So beta, uh, well, I don't think it's anywhere. Yeah, beta is over there, right? So I just replace A by what I see. A is just becoming this guy plus this guy and this guy plus this guy. Everybody's comfortable with this uh, computation? All right, so we just agreed that beta priors for Bernoulli observations are certainly convenient, right? And uh, because they're just conjugate and we know that's what's going to come out in the end, that's going to be a, a beta as well. So, I mean, you know, I just claim it was convenient. It was certainly convenient to compute this, right? I mean, there was some, certainly some compatibility when I had to multiply this function by that function, and you can imagine that things could go much more wrong than just having p to some power and p to some power, one minus p to some power, one minus p to some other to some power. Things were nice. Now, this is nice, but I can also question the following things. Why a beta, for one? I mean, a beta uh, tells me something, but you know that's convenient, but then how do I pick A? I know that A should definitely uh, uh, capture the fact that uh, I want where I want to have my p most likely located, but it also actually it also captures the variance of my beta. And so choosing different a's is going to have different functions. If I have a and b, if I started with the beta with parameter uh, if here, I started with a b here, I would just pick up the b here. Agreed? And that would just be asymmetric, but they're going to capture mean invariance of this thing. And so how do I pick those guys, right? I mean, if I'm a doctor and I'm, you're asking me, what do you think the chances of this drug working on this kind of patients is? And I have to say, to spit out the parameters of a beta for you, it might be a bit of a complicated thing to do. So how do you do this, especially for problems? So by now, people have actually, you know, found, mastered the art of coming up with, you know, what, how to formulate those numbers. But in new problems that come up, how do you do this? What do you, happens if you want to use Bayesian methods, but you actually do not know what you expect to see? Maybe this is the first time you, I mean, to be fair, before we started this class, I hope all of you had no idea whether people tend to, to bend their head to the right or to the left before kissing, because if you did, well, you have too much time on your hand and I should double your homework. And um, so in this case, you have to sort of, maybe you still want to use the Bayesian machinery. Maybe you just want to do something nice. It's nice, right? I mean, it worked out pretty well. And so what if you want to do? Well, you actually want to use some priors that have no, carry no information, that basically do not prefer any theta to another theta. Now, you could read this slide, or you could look at this formula. We just said that this pi here was just here to weigh some thetas more than others, depending on our prior belief. If our prior belief does not want to put any preference towards some thetas than to others, what do I do? Yeah, I remove it. And the way to remove something we multiply by is just replace it by one. That's really what we're doing, right? So if this was a constant, then not depending on theta, then that would mean that we're not preferring any theta. And we're looking sort of the likely, at, at the likelihood but not as a function that we're trying to maximize, but as a function that we normalize in such a way that it's actually a distribution. So if I have pi, which is not here, this is really just taking the likelihood, which is a positive function, may not integrate to one, so I normalize it so that it integrates to one. And then I just say, well, this is my posterior distribution. Now, I could just maximize this thing and spit out my maximum likelihood estimator, but now I can also integrate and find what the expectation of this guy is. I can find what the median of this guy is. I can sample data from this guy. I can build, you know, understand what the variance of this guy is, which we, is something we did not do when we just did maximum likelihood estimation because given a function, all we cared about was the maximum, of, the arg max of this function. Okay, so if you, you these th priors are called uninformative. 
All right, so this is just replacing this number by one. And if I have a, or by a constant, right, because it still has to be a density. And so if I have something which is, uh, uh, if I have a bounded set, I'm just looking for the uniform distribution on this bounded set, the one that puts constant uh, one over the size of this thing. But if I have an unbounded set, what is, what is the density that takes a constant value on the entire real line, for example? What is this density? Doesn't exist, right? I mean, it just doesn't exist. I mean, you know, you, the way you can think of it is a Gaussian with the variance going to infinity maybe, or something like this. But you can think of it in many ways. You can think of the, the limit of the uniform between minus t and t with t going to infinity. But this thing is actually zero, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing there. And so when you're, you can actually still talk about this, right? You could always talk about this thing where you think of this guy as being a constant, remove this thing from this equation, and just say, well, my posterior is just the likelihood divided by the integral of the likelihood over theta. And if theta is the entire real line, so be it. As long as this integral converges, you can still talk about this stuff. And so this is what's called an improper prior, right? An improper prior is just a non-negative function defined on theta, but it does not have to integrate neither to one nor to anything, okay? It does not have to, right? If I integrate the function equal to one on the entire real line, what do I get? Infinity. Right? I mean, it's not, uh, it's not a proper integral, and so it's not a proper prior, and it's called an improper prior. And those improper priors are usually what you see when you start to want non-informative priors on infinite set thetas. I mean, that's just the nature of it. It's just, you should think of them as being the uniform prior on some infinite, the uniform distribution of some infinite set, if that thing were to exist. Okay, so, uh, let's see some examples about non-informative priors, right? So if I'm on the uniform, if I'm on the uh, interval 0, 1, this is a finite set, so I can talk about the uh, uniform prior on the interval 0, 1 for a parameter p of a Bernoulli, okay? And so, So if I want to uh, if I want to talk about this, then it means that my prior is p follows some uniform on the interval zero one. Okay, so that means that the density is well f of x is one if x is in zero one and zero. Otherwise, there's actually not even a normalization. This thing integrates to one. And so now, if I look at my likelihood, it's still the same thing. So my posterior becomes theta x1, xn. So that's my posterior. I don't write the likelihood again because we still have it. Uh, he, uh, well, we don't have it here anymore. Uh, is it here? Or did I just erase? Yeah, the likelihood is given here. All right, so copy paste over there. And so the posterior is just this thing times one. So you will see it in a second. So it's p times the sum uh, to the power sum of the xi's, one minus p to the power n minus sum of the xi's. And then it's like multiplied by one and then divided by this integral between zero and one of p sum of the xi's, one minus p n minus sum of the xi's dp which does not depend on p, and I really don't care what this thing actually is, okay? So now, sorry, that's uh, pr prior posterior of, the, of p, uh, and uh, now I can see, well, what is this? Well, it's actually just the beta with parameters, this guy plus one, and, this guy plus one. So 
I didn't tell you what the expectation of a beta was, right? We don't know what the expectation of a beta is. Agreed? I mean, if I wanted to find, say, the expectation of this thing, that would be some good estimator. We know that the maximum of this guy, what is the maximum of this thing here? Well, it's just this thing, right? I mean, it's uh, the average of the Xi's, right? That's just the maximum likelihood estimator for Bernoulli. We know it's the average. Do you think if I take the expectation of this thing, I'm going to get the average? So actually, I'm not going to get the average. I'm going to get this guy plus this guy divided by n plus 1. So I'm going to do as if I had, uh, sorry. OK, let me not say it like that. Let's look at what this thing is doing. It's looking at the number of zeros, uh, so the number of ones, and it's adding one. And this guy is looking at the number of zeros, and it's adding one. OK? Why is it adding this one? What's going on here? Well, what would happen if I had, so this actually is going to matter mostly when the number of ones is actually zero or the number of zeros is zero. Because what it does is just pushes the zero from non-zero. And why is that something that this Bayesian method actually does for you automatically? It's because when we put this non-informative prior on P, which was uniform on the interval 0, 1, in particular, we know that the probability that P is equal to 0 is 0, and the probability that P is equal to 1 is 0. And so the problem is that essentially, if I did not add this 1, with some positive probability, I would be allowed to spit out something that actually had, had P hat, which was equal to 0. In the case, if by chance, let's say I have n is equal to 3, and I get only 0, 0, 0, right? That could happen with probability 1 over P cubed. Uh, 1 over 1 minus p cubed, uh, sorry, 1 minus p cubed, uh, then this thing is just going to not, uh, that's not something that I want, and I'm actually using my prior. So my prior is not informative, but somehow it captures the fact that I don't want to believe that p is going to be either equal to 0 or 1. Okay, and so that's uh, sort of taken care of here. Okay, so uh, let's move away uh, a little bit from the uh, Bernoulli example, shall we? I mean, we think we've seen enough of it. And so let's talk about the Gaussian model, right? Let's say I want to do Gaussian inference in the, um, in the uh, uh, I want to do inference in a Gaussian model using Bayesian methods. Okay, so uh, I'm going to actually look at, so say, okay, so what I want is that uh, xi, x1, xn, or say uh, n01 uh, iid, uh, sorry, theta1 iid conditionally on theta. Okay, so that means that pn of x1, xn given theta is equal to, well, exactly what I wrote before, so 1 square root 2 pi to the n exponential minus 1 half sum of xi minus theta squared. Okay, so that's just the joint distribution of my n Gaussians with mean theta. And now the question is, what is the posterior distribution? Okay, well, here I said, let's use the uninformative prior, which is an improper prior, right? It puts weight one on everyone. That's the so-called uniform on the entire real line. So that's certainly not a density, but I can still just use this, right? So all I need to do is to is to uh, get uh, uh, um, this divided by uh, normalizing this thing, right? So that's what I need to do. But if I look at this, right? So essentially, I want to understand. So this is proportional to exponential minus 1 half sum from i equal 1 to n of xi minus theta squared. And now I want to see this thing as a density not on the xi's, but on theta, right? What I want is a density on theta. So it looks like I have chances of getting something that looks like a Gaussian. But if I, I really need to have a Gaussian, I would need to see minus 1 half. And then I would need to see theta minus something here. Okay, not just the sum of something minus theta. So I need to work a little bit more so I can see what this, um, to expand the square here. So 
So this thing here is going to be equal to exponential minus 1 half sum from i equal 1 to n of xi squared minus 2 xi theta plus theta squared. Okay? Okay, and so now basically what I'm going to do is everything, remember, is up to this little sign, right? So every time I see a term that does not depend on theta, I can just push it in there and just make it disappear. Agreed? Okay, this term here, exponential minus one-half sum of xi squared, does it depend on theta? No, so I'm just pushing it here. This guy, yes, and the other one, yes. So this is proportional to exponential xi, uh, sorry, sum of the xi. And then I'm going to pull out my theta. The minus 1 half cancel with the minus 2. And then I have minus 1 half sum from i equal 1 to n of theta squared, right? Agreed? So now what this thing looks like, well, this looks very much like some theta minus something squared. This thing here is really just uh, n over 2 times theta. So, oh, sorry, times theta squared. So now what I need to do is to write this of the form theta minus something, let's call it mu, squared, maybe divided by, sigma, divided by 2 sigma squared, right? I want to turn this into that, maybe up to terms that do not depend on, on theta. That's what I'm going to try to do. So that's called completing the square, and that's some exercise you do. You've done it probably already in the homework, and uh, that's something you do a lot uh, when you do uh, Bayesian statistics in particular. So let's do this. Well, what is going to be the leading term? Well, theta squared is going to be multiplied by this thing. So I'm going to pull out my n over 2, and then I'm going to write this as theta squared minus and uh, one, uh, sorry, minus theta over two, and then I'm going to write theta square uh, theta minus something squared, and this something is going to be one half of what I see in the cross product, right? Uh, well, I need to actually pull this thing out. So, okay, let me write it like that first. So that's theta squared, and then I'm going to write it as minus two times one over n sum from i equal 1 to n of xi's times theta, right? That's exactly just a rewriting of what we had before. And that should look much more familiar. x squared minus, a, uh, sorry, a squared minus 2 blab a, and then I miss something. So this thing I'm going to be able to rewrite as theta minus xn bar squared, but then I need to remove the square of xn bar because it's not here. OK? So I just complete the square. And then I, I actually really don't care what this thing actually was, because it's going to go again in the uh, little uh, alpha sign over there. So this thing eventually is going to be proportional to exponential of minus n over 2 times theta minus xn bar squared. And so we know that if this is a density that's proportional to this guy, it has to be some n with mean xn bar and variance. Well, this is supposed to be 1 over sigma squared, this guy over here, this n. So that's really just 1 over n. OK? So the posterior distribution. is a Gaussian centered at my, the average of my observations and with a variance 1 over n, OK? Everybody's with me? So just why I'm saying this, I mean, this is, was the output of some computation, but it sort of makes sense, right? It's really telling me that the more observations I have, the more concentrated this posterior is, concentrated around what? Well, around this xn bar. 
So that looks like something we've sort of seen before, but it does not have the same meaning somehow. This is really just a posterior distribution and it's not really, I mean, it sort of says, it's sort of a sanity check that I have this one over n when I have xn bar, but it's not the same thing as saying that the variance of xn bar was one over n like we had before, okay? So as an exercise, well, you probably will have it, but I would recommend if you don't get it, uh, just try uh, pi of theta to be equal to some n mu one. Okay, so you start, so here the prior that we use was completely non-informative. What happens if I take my prior to be some Gaussian, which is centered at mu and it has the same variance as the other guys, okay? So what's gonna happen here is that we're gonna put a weight and everything that's away from mu is gonna actually get less weight, right? And uh, I wanna know how I'm gonna be updating this prior into a posterior, so that's, uh, uh, right? So everybody sees what I'm saying here? So pi of theta is just, uh, so that means that pi of theta has the density proportional to exponential minus one half theta minus mu squared, right? So I need to multiply my, uh, my uh, uh, posterior with this and then uh, see what, it's like actually gonna be a Gaussian. This is also a conjugate prior. It's gonna spit out another Gaussian. You're gonna have to complete a square again and just check uh, what it's actually giving you. And so spoiler alert, it's gonna look like you get an extra observation which is actually equal to mu. Okay, so it's gonna, it's gonna be the average of n plus one observations, the first n ones being x one to x n and the last one being uh, mu. And it sort of makes sense. Okay, so that's actually a fairly simple exercise, but uh, before, uh, uh, rather than going into more computation, this is something you can definitely do uh, in, your, in the comfort of your room. Uh, I wanna talk about other types of priors, right? So the first thing I said is, okay, are, there's this beta prior that I just pull out of my hat and that was just convenient. Then there was this non-informative prior. It was convenient, right? It was non-informative. So if you don't know anything else, maybe that's what you wanna do. The question is, are there any other priors that are sort of principled and generic in the sense that the uh, in, in, in uninformative prior was generic, right? I mean, it was equal to one, that's as generic as it gets. And so is there anything that's generic as well? Well, there's this prior that are called Jeffreys priors. And Jeffreys prior is a prior which is proportional to square root of the determinant of the Fisher information of theta, okay? And so this is actually kind of a weird thing to do, right? It says, compute your, look at your model, right? Your model is gonna have a Fisher information. Let's say it exists. And uh, uh, because you know, we know it does not always exist. For example, in the multinomial model, we didn't have a, a Fisher information. And so the determinant of a matrix is somehow measuring the size of a matrix, right? And if you don't trust me, just think about the matrix being of size one by one, then the determinant is just the number that you have there. And so this is really something that looks like uh, the Fisher information, uh, I mean, it's just basically the amount of information is proportional to the amount of information that you have at a certain point, okay? And so what my prior is saying, it's saying, well, I want to put more weights on those thetas that are gonna just like extract more information from the data, okay? So you can actually compute those things, right? So in the first example, uh, uh, Jeffrey's prior is something that looks like this, right? I mean, in one dimension, Fisher information is essentially uh, one over the variance, right? So that's just one over the square root of the variance because I have the square root. And uh, when I have the uniform, um, sorry, uh, the Jeffrey's prior, when I have uh, um, uh, the Gaussian case, right? So the, this is the identity matrix that I would have in the Gaussian case. So the determinant of the identity is one, so square root of one is one, and so I would basically get one, and that gives me my improper prior, that I, my uninformative prior that I had. Okay, so the uninformative prior one is fine. I mean, you know, clearly all the thetas carry the same information in the Gaussian model, right? I mean, whether I translate it here or here, it's pretty clear not, not, none of them is actually better than the other. But clearly for the Bernoulli case, that are closer, uh, uh, the piece that are closer to the boundary, right, 
carry more information, right? So I sort of like those guys because they just like carry more information. So what I do is that I take this function, so p1 minus p, remember, is something that looks like this on the interval 0, 1, 0, and 1. So this guy, 1 over square root of p1 minus p, is something that looks like this. Agreed? And so what it's doing is sort of like wants to push towards the p's that actually carry more information. I mean, whether you want to bias your data that way or not is something you need to think about, right? I mean, when you put a prior on your data, on your parameter, you're sort of like biasing towards this idea, your data, and maybe, you know, that's maybe not such a good idea when you have, um, when you're, you're, you have some p that's actually close to one half, for example. You're actually saying, no, I don't want to see a p that's close to one half. Just make a decision one way or another, but just make a decision. So it's sort of forcing you to do that. Okay, and so, Jeffrey's prior, so I'm, uh, I'm running out of time, so I don't want to go uh, into too much details, uh, but uh, we'll probably stop here, actually. Uh, so, um, so Jeffrey's prior, okay, sorry. What happened here? Yeah, so Jeffrey's priors have this very nice property, is that they actually do not care about the parameterization of your space. Okay, so if you actually have p and you suddenly decide that p is not the right parameter for Bernoulli, but it's p squared, okay? You could decide to parameterize this by p squared. Maybe your doctor is actually much more able to formulate some prior assumption on p squared rather than p. You never know. And so what happens is that Jeffrey's priors are in, invariant into this. And the reason is because, well, the information carried by p is the same as the information carried by p squared somehow, right? I mean those are essentially the same, the, I mean, well, yeah, they're essentially the same thing. And so, uh, uh, so I mean, you need to have a one-to-one -one map, right, where you basically, for each parameter uh, uh, before you have another parameter, so let's call eta the new parameters. Then the PDF uh, 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 of the, so the PDF of the new prior indexed by eta this time is actually also Jeffrey's prior, but this time the new Fisher information is not the Fisher information with respect to theta, but it's this in the Fisher information to this, uh, associated to the statistical model indexed by eta. So essentially when you change Jeffrey's prior, you still, when you change the parameterization of your model, you still get Jeffrey's prior for the new parameterization, which is in a way a desirable property. All right, so uh, uh, that's, so Jeffrey's priors, just like non-informative priors, are priors you want to use when you don't, when you want it systematic way without really thinking about what to pick for your model. Okay, so, uh, well, uh, okay, I'll finish this next time. And uh, uh, we'll talk about Bayesian confidence regions. We'll talk about Bayesian estimation. Once I have a posterior, uh, what do I get? And basically the only message is going to be that well, you might want to integrate against the posterior, find the posterior, the expectation of your posterior distribution. That's a good point estimator for theta. And then uh, we'll, just do, uh, we'll just do a couple of, uh, of computation. All right, so. Uh